Hey everybody, what's going on? This is Sam from Historic Travels and welcome to another video. And as always, before we get started today, I'd just like to take a quick moment to welcome all my new subscribers and to thank everybody who's leaving me comments and messages down below. Thank you guys, I really appreciate it. And just so you all know, the video that you are about to watch is another combination video, just like what I did a few months ago with my Titanic series. Well, this is the same thing, except with the Costa Concordia series. So this video has both episodes one and episode two of my series on the Costa Concordia just combined into one episode. All right, everybody. Well, hey, with that out of the way, let's get into today's topic. The Costa Concordia was a massive modern day cruise ship that was designed to carry passengers and crew to various destinations all across the world. Now the ship was owned by the Costa Corporation, which is also part of the Carnival Corporation, the same company that operates Carnival Cruise Lines, the biggest cruise company in the entire world. The Costa Corporation ordered the Costa Concordia in 2004 with construction of the ship finishing in 2006 and this was also the same year the ship entered service. And this ship was designed to be the very best that the Costa Corporation could offer. Massive atrium, tons of pools, tons of restaurants, bars, casinos, day spa, you name it, this ship had it. And this ship could carry roughly 3,700 passengers as long as another 1,000 crew members to help care for all the passengers. This truly was a massive modern day cruise ship and she was a very successful cruise ship for the several years that this vessel was in service. The Costa Concordia's captain was this man, Francesco Scatino. He had been the captain of this ship since 2006, and he had actually worked for the Costa Company since 2002. So he had a ton of experience with the Costa Concordia, and it's safe to say he knew the ship pretty well. Now, even though I said the Costa Concordia could sail all over the world, she was primarily only used for the Italian market and sailed in the Mediterranean. And in this area, she was an incredibly successful cruise ship. She carried hundreds of thousands of passengers over her six years of service. And overall, the public really liked and really enjoyed this vessel. However, everything changed in January of 2012 when something would happen to the Costa Concordia that would change the lives of everyone on board this ship forever. On January the 11th, 2012, the Costa Concordia was preparing to head out on a seven-day voyage that would take it all around the Mediterranean. It would leave from the city of Calgary, and then it would head over to Palamaru, Sicily. And then from there, it would head up to Civita Vecchia. And then, yeah, it would just continue on this course, taking it to several cities and different countries all around the Mediterranean Sea. Now, during the beginning part of this voyage, things proceeded pretty smoothly on board the Costa Concordia. She made it to Sicily without any problems. She proceeded from there up to Chevesta Vecchia without any issues. Now, you can take this as a bad sign or not. It's up to you. But when the ship made it to Chevesta Vecchia, it was Friday the 13th. Ugh, bad day. Actually, it really was a bad day. So, as the ship left that city... That evening, as the ship was proceeding en route to its next destination, the crew decided to do something a little bit different. They decided to divert the Costa Concordia's course to head over to another island called the Island of Giglio. And they weren't going to stop the ship there, but essentially what they were going to do was do what's known as a sail by salute, where a ship comes in pretty close to an island and it's just kind of like a, kind of like a show for the people on the island to see this massive ship cruise by. It's a pretty cool event for all the passengers on board the ship to see. It was just a, I guess you could consider it kind of like a stunt or something, you know, just something the crew on board the Costa Concordia wanted to do to pay respect to the island of Julio and give the passengers on board the Costa Concordia a cool thing to see during that night of the voyage. Now, when I say it was the crew's decision to do this sail by salute of the island of Julio, this is more or less true. However, the decision to actually do this sail by salute rests mostly with the captain. It's just this wasn't that uncommon of a thing for him, so the crew didn't protest and they all just kind of went along with it. Now, doing a sail by salute isn't really that uncommon. A lot of ships during the time and still now do this. And you see, the island of Julio isn't that far off of the Costa Concordia's original route. As you can see from this map, as soon as the Costa Concordia left Chevoslovakia, the gray line you see is the Costa Costa Concordia's original route, and the little red line you see at the top of this map shows the improvised route that the Costa Concordia took to the island of Julio. So as you can see, it really isn't that far out of their way for the Costa Concordia just to do a quick sail by of this island. And another thing, the Costa Concordia had done sail by salutes of this island in the past. In this footage you see right here, this video was shot in August of the previous year, so August 2011. And you can plain as day see the Costa Concordia sailing by doing a sail by salute of the island of Julia, just like what the crew planned to do on this crossing in January of 2012. 
Now, here's where things start to go wrong on board the Costa Concordia. You see, to do this sail by salute, the captain was looking for a big show. You know, he was wanting to really impress the passengers on board the ship. So he was going to try to bring in the Costa Concordia as close to the shoreline as possible. He was actually shooting to get the Costa Concordia within 1,500 feet of the island shore, which is extremely close and very dangerous for a massive cruise ship to get to an island. Like, very, very dangerous. Now, as they were doing this, you know, getting the ship close to the island, the helmsman, the person who is driving the Costa Concordia, he didn't speak English or Italian very well, which was the two prominent languages on board the ship. So there was a miscommunication between him and the ship's captain, and he ended up bringing the ship much closer to the island shoreline than what they had originally planned. Now, it didn't take the bridge officers very long to realize the mistake of the helmsman, and they quickly ordered the Costa Concordia to turn hard to starboard in an attempt to turn the Costa Concordia away from the rocks and get it to a safe distance once again from the island of Julio. However, at this point, it was too late. The Costa Concordia was traveling at roughly 16 knots, so this hindered the vessel's ability to turn due to the increased speed and how massive this vessel is. And at around 9.45 p.m. on Friday the 13th of 2012, the Costa Concordia hit a massive rock just off the coastline of the island of Julio, puncturing several watertight compartments and leaving a massive boulder in the hull of the ship. Now, anytime you have a situation where you have a vessel come into contact with something and it actually punctures the ship's hull and allows water to come in, that's a very serious situation. However, I would argue that what happened to the Costa Concordia was actually much worse. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, in order to properly explain, let's compare the impact that the Costa Concordia had with the rock with the impact that the Titanic had with the iceberg. Now, on paper, it doesn't really seem like there's much of a comparison, but honestly, still by comparing the two, it can teach us a few things. So, when the Titanic struck the iceberg, the iceberg damaged roughly 300 feet of the Titanic's hull, from front of the ship all the way to after the first funnel, and it damaged roughly 300 feet of the Titanic's hull. Now, one thing to keep in mind, the iceberg did not cause a massive rip right along the Titanic's hull. It wasn't like one massive hole. It was essentially a bunch of small little gashes all along the Titanic's hull that allowed seawater to come in. Now, when the iceberg, when the Titanic hit the iceberg, it opened up roughly six of the Titanic's watertight compartments. Now, let's jump over to the Concordia for a second. And just for reference material, just pretend that in this situation, my Titanic model is the Coast of Concordia. When the Costa Concordia hit the rock, it only damaged 160 to 170 feet of the Costa Concordia's hull, opening up three of the Costa Concordia's seven watertight compartments. Still a very serious situation, but it wasn't as bad as the Titanic's impact. However, this damage would in fact sink the ship. You know, with three compartments out of the seven gone, the Costa Concordia could not stay afloat. I believe the Concordia could handle two watertight compartments breach, but don't quote me on that. But what makes this even worse is where the Costa Concordia got opened up by the rock. You see, on the Costa Concordia, the rock opened up roughly 160 to 170 feet of the hull as one big gash, and it was located right around midship to aft. So 160 to 170 feet of this section of the Concordia was opened up by the rock. As I said, very serious, and the ship would inevitably sink, but what made it worse was the actual compartments that were opened up by the rock. You see, the rock opened up the hull right around the area where the Costa Concordia's engine room was. So that meant that within 30 seconds of the Concordia hitting that rock, the ship lost all electrical power. They lost all the ability to be able to control the ship, so they couldn't use the ship's engines. They couldn't adjust the ship's rudder. I mean, and the power went out almost immediately. Now, the Concordia did have an emergency backup system, which did kick in. But still, because of where the Concordia hit the rock, it severely limited the crew's ability to be able to deal with the incoming water. And if we jump back to the Titanic for a second, even though the Titanic had a much larger area of the iceberg, or I'm sorry, a much larger area of the hull of the ship opened up by the iceberg, the water was contained to the front of the ship, nowhere near where the Titanic's engine room and the power generator and all that stuff was. So even though the ship was sinking, the Titanic was still able to keep basic infrastructure or basic systems on the ship going which really did help the crew when it came to evacuating the Titanic. However, the Costa Concordia's crew did not have that luxury. The rock had opened up the hull of the ship in the worst possible area. 
Now, at the time of the impact, several of the Costa Concordia's passengers were still enjoying a very late dinner. Now, in this dining room, it was located in a deeper section of the Concordia, closer to where the impact was. And these passengers felt the impact pretty strongly. Several passengers said that things actually fell from shelves or upper levels of this room and actually fell on their heads. So, in this room... It was very chaotic for the passengers and crew because the passengers were confused about what happened, the crew in this room didn't know what happened, and they were doing their best to keep the passengers calm. However, in this section of the ship, people were starting to panic. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to play you some of this clip with audio so you can get a basic understanding of the situation in this room just after the impact. <laughs> Now, around five minutes after the Costa Concordia hit the rock, the bridge crew did make an announcement to the entire ship, letting all the passengers know that what they were experiencing was just a power failure. It wasn't any danger to the ship and that they were completely okay and that the uh, technicians on board the Concordia were working to resolve the problem. Now, if I would have been a passenger on board the Concordia and I felt the ship shake and vibrate, saw things fall from the shelves, and then the power goes out, yeah, I wouldn't believe them if they made that announcement. I would really believe that we had hit something or that something was going on. What about all of you guys? Would you guys think that something more serious was going on if you felt the ship vibrate, saw things fall from the shelves, and then the bridge crew just says that you're just experiencing a power failure? What would you guys think? Maybe it's just me being paranoid because of how fascinated I've been with a certain other vessel throughout the course of my life. Now, at roughly 10 p.m. or so, Captain Scatino was on the phone with the Costa Corporation, letting them know about the situation that was currently unfolding on board his ship. Now, also around this time, one of the Costa Concordia's engineers came up from the engine room up to the bridge to let the bridge crew know about the situation they were currently facing deep within the Costa Concordia. He told them that the boulder had, in fact, opened up three compartments, uh, three watertight compartments to be exact, on the Costa Concordia's port side. However, water was beginning to spill over into a fourth watertight compartment and the Costa Concordia was beginning to list a port. Yet, even with all of this going on, the bridge crew on board the Costa Concordia did not order an abandoned ship, and did not tell the passengers to begin making their way to the lifeboats. Now, if I would have been the captain of the Costa Concordia and I had just learned all of this, this would have been the time that I would have begun the evacuation of the ship. I mean, think about it. You've got three compartments flooded. You've got a fourth compartment starting to flood. On top of that, the ship is listing to port. And if you take a look at this map, this map shows the Costa Concordia's route that night. The ship is beginning to drift further and further out to sea. So, yeah, the situation is getting really serious on board the Concordia, and if you don't start the evacuation soon, you run the risk of this ship capsizing and taking everyone with it. Now, at this point, the crew on board the Costa Concordia get a little bit lucky. You see, even though the ship was starting to drift further out to sea, there was a very strong wind that night blowing to the west, and this wind actually caught the Concordia and began pushing it back towards the island of Julio. And another factor that actually helped this process was due to the fact that the very last command that the ship's crew put into the ship's helm before they lost all helm control was to turn the ship's rudder hard to starboard. So the rudder remained in this position even though they had lost all ability to control it. And this actually helped the Costa Concordia turn with the wind and allowed the wind to push the Costa Concordia further towards the shoreline. So really, it was this miracle that actually prevented the disaster of the Costa Concordia from being a lot worse than it otherwise would have been if the ship had continued to drift further out to sea. Now the wind would eventually push the Costa Concordia all the way back up to the shoreline of the island of Julio, and the vessel would essentially beach itself not too far off the coast. And it was this miracle that would keep the Costa Concordia from sinking all the way. The vessel would founder and it would sink about halfway-ish. But due to the fact that the vessel was right off the coastline, the ship would not completely founder and a lot of lives would end up being saved. Now, before we go more into that, I want to jump back to the time frame right as soon as the Costa Concordia was beginning to drift towards the island. So roughly 10 to 10.05 p.m. You see, right around this time, there was one other thing that was going on. The harbor at the island of Julio noticed the strange behavior of the Costa Concordia and actually radioed the ship and asked them, hey, what's going on? Do you need help? And of course, Captain Scatino said, no, we're just experiencing a blackout. However, the harbor continued to observe the ship. And as the Costa Concordia was beginning to drift around and do all these strange maneuvers and was beginning to be pushed back towards the island of Julio, 
they were getting more and more suspicious. Another vessel that was in the area actually attempted to contact the Costa Concordia and asked them if they needed help, at which they received no response. And at roughly one hour or so after the collision, the port authorities were finally told of the situation on board the Costa Concordia. And it was also at this point that emergency personnel were starting to be alerted, like the Coast Guard and stuff like that. Honestly, this was sheer negligence in part of the ship's crew. And yes, I do blame the captain for this, but honestly, the ship's officers on board should have also taken steps to let people know what was going on when they saw the behavior of the captain. I mean, I know that's easy for me to say at this point looking back, but still, if I would have been on the bridge that night and I would have seen what's been going on, I would have taken steps to let somebody know, hey, the Costa Concordia is in trouble and we need to start doing something to get these passengers and crew off of this ship before it sinks. Now remember earlier in this video how I talked about how the Costa Concordia was beginning to list a port because she struck the rock on the port side? Well, as the wind was beginning to push the Concordia back towards land, the listing of the ship changed a bit. You see, the ship at this point began listing not to port, but she actually started leaning to starboard. So that meant the ship righted itself and then started leaning in the opposite direction. So how could this happen? My first thought would be maybe the wind actually ended up pushing the ship more to starboard, but that didn't really make a lot of sense to me because with how heavy water is and how big of a ship this was, how strong would the wind have to blow in order to cause a big shift in the listing of a ship like this? Well, I did a little bit of research, and the wind was partially responsible. However, there was also another culprit that caused the Concordia to begin listing to starboard. Now, in order to properly explain why the Costa Concordia began to develop a list to starboard, let's turn to the closest model I have that actually looks like the Costa Concordia, my Carnival ship. And it's a new model. You guys haven't seen this one before. So I guess it does make sense that the Costa Concordia and the Carnival ship would look alike since they were both owned by the same company, but whatever. So as we all know, as the Costa Concordia was sailing along, it struck a rock on the port side and the ship began listing to port. This makes sense. However, the reason the ship began listing to starboard is a little bit complicated. So initially, not too long after the ship hit the rock and began listing to port and the port side compartments of the vessel began to flood, Essentially what they do now when they're building modern day vessels is they design these ships, if they're going to sink and going to start flooding, they design the compartments of these ships to do what's called cross flooding. Meaning the compartments inside a vessel will allow the water to move from the port side of the ship where the ship is flooding and head over to the starboard side in an effort to bring the ship back on an even keel. And the reason they do this is to try to fight the whole ship's listing and sinking to one side. And honestly, this makes perfect sense because what good is it to have enough lifeboats on a vessel if a ship is going to begin to sink and list in one direction so much that you can't launch half of the lifeboats? Makes perfect sense. So this system was on board the Costa Concordia and it was working very well. So the Costa Concordia hit the rock, the ship began listing to port, then the cross flooding system kicked in and brought the ship back on an even keel. So if there were no other factors in this, the ship would have just sunk very evenly and straight down, giving the crew the opportunity to launch all the lifeboats from the ship before she sank. Now it's debatable if they would have had enough time to do so, I'm not really sure, it all has to do with how the flooding was proceeding, but still, now you get the idea of the whole cross flooding thing, and it makes perfect sense. But things would actually change on the Concordia. Remember that very strong wind that I was talking about that was beginning to push the ship back towards the island of Julio? Well, it did play a factor. So as the ship was sitting perfectly level and beginning to do that crazy drift maneuver you saw earlier that would inevitably push it back towards the island, the wind, ended up giving the ship just the slightest, slightest, slightest little list to starboard. because, And then it ended up pushing the water to the starboard side. Just a little. I'm talking very, very small. And then as the ship began to be pushed closer and closer toward the island of Julia and start drifting back, when the ship, just pretend that my hand here is the shoreline of the island of Julio, when the ship came up and the bottom of the ship hit land or hit the rock underneath the ocean, this put even more strain on the ship and caused it to lean even further to starboard. So the water is already on the starboard side due to the wind, the ship makes contact with the land, and then it even pushes the ship further to starboard, thus causing the ship to begin to capsize in the starboard direction. 
I hope I explained this pretty clearly. It's pretty complicated and it's kind of hard to follow. But yeah, this is the main reason why the Costa Concordia ended up listing to starboard, even though she did hit the rock on the port side. In the end, the Costa Concordia would end up beaching itself just off the coast of the island of Julio. However, the water was deep enough where the vessel came to rest that they could actually begin to launch the Costa Concordia's lifeboats on the ship's starboard side. The list of the ship became so great that it became impossible to launch any of the lifeboats on the port side of the Costa Concordia, and this would inevitably have a major impact on the evacuation of the ship. In the last episode, we talked about how the cruise ship Costa Concordia, while attempting to perform a sail-by salute of the island of Julio, ended up coming in too close towards the island and struck some rocks just off the coastline. And then the vessel ended up beaching itself just off the coast of the same island and ended up partially capsizing. In this episode, we are going to continue the story of the Costa Concordia and tell the story of the ship and all the people who were on board the vessel that night. Now in the last episode, we talked about how the bridge crew on board the Costa Concordia were not being very open with people as to the true extent to the danger they were in on board the Costa Concordia after the vessel hit the rock. Remember, the bridge crew did not tell the Coast Guard, they did not tell like the people on the island of Julio or anybody who could actually help out the extent of the damage and the situation they were facing. The only people the bridge crew at this point have told that the ship's in trouble is the Costa Company's emergency hotline but they don't have any immediate access to get help to the vessel. Everybody else who can actually help is still in the dark. They think that this is just a blackout, although they are kind of suspicious. And you see, this is also true for the passengers. Right up to the point that the vessel hit the rock and the power failed, the bridge crew only told the passengers that they were just experiencing a blackout. And as the vessel was doing all of those weird maneuvers you saw in the last episode before the vessel actually ended up beaching itself on the rocks, the passengers on board the Concordia were beginning to get more and more suspicious of the bridge crew, and some of them actually started to take matters into their own hands. You see, from the moment the Costa Concordia ended up striking the rock, leading up to the moment at which the vessel finally beached itself just off the coast of the island of Julio, this entire process took roughly 24 minutes. And you see, during this time, the vessel would end up initially listing to port, and then the vessel would end up listing to starboard. And to all the passengers on board who were experiencing this, well, they were concerned. And up to this point, the bridge crew was still telling all the passengers that it was just a blackout. But all the while, the passengers are noticing the Costa Concordia listing more and more. So you see, at this point, the passengers on board the ship, since they weren't getting any answers or response from the bridge crew, ended up taking matters into their own hands and started going to the lifeboats on the Costa Concordia themselves. And upon learning this, the bridge crew actually made an announcement to all of the passengers in response to their actions. Upon learning what some of the passengers on board the Costa Concordia were doing, the bridge crew actually sent a member of the ship's staff down to deck four on board the Costa Concordia, where all the vessel's lifeboats were, and actually told the passengers who were waiting there to just to go back to their rooms and wait while they fixed the ship's electric generator. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Do you have any idea how dangerous that is? Because maybe at this point, the crew did not know for certain that the Costa Concordia was going to sink yet. However, they were completely aware that the vessel was taking on water. And you have to remember that a lot of staterooms on these ships are actually pretty close to the waterline below deck four. So by telling passengers just to go back to their rooms and wait, you are sending passengers deep inside a potentially sinking vessel. Do you have any idea how dangerous that is? What if the water actually reaches a deck where these passengers are sitting waiting in their staterooms? You could potentially trap them in their room and they would drown when the ship sinks. Completely naive and complete negligence of the ship's crew to actually make this announcement in my opinion. And you see something else that's going on that I can't even begin to comprehend is that the bridge crew or the crew on the Concordia in general have not begun to prep the ship's lifeboats yet. Let's actually jump to the Titanic for a moment here and compare the Titanic to the Costa Concordia. Do you want to know what Captain Smith did not long after the Titanic struck the iceberg? Before they even knew for certain that the Titanic was sinking, one of the first actions the captain did was he had the crew begin prepping the Titanic's lifeboats just as a precaution, just in case they would need to evacuate. The Costa Concordia's crew did no such thing. 
So the only thing the crew was doing at this point on board the Concordia was just trying to figure out the situation of the ship and to find out for certain if the vessel was sinking or not. All the while, they're not telling anyone, you know, the Coast Guard, the passengers, anybody, what's really going on. This was complete negligence of the ship's crew, in my opinion. And honestly, they put so many more lives at risk by not telling passengers what was going on and just by telling them to go and wait in their staterooms. Now, the coast of Concordia had finally beached itself off of the coast of the island of Julio at roughly 10.10, 10.15 p.m. However, even after this had happened, the bridge crew on the ship still didn't order an abandoned ship. Even though the coast of Concordia's list to starboard had greatly increased and greatly accelerated upon the vessel making contact with the seafloor just off the coast of the island of Julio. In fact, the listing of the ship got so bad that the passengers actually started climbing into the lifeboats of the Concordia themselves without any crew or any members of the ship's staff to assist them. And then finally, at 10.35 p.m., the Costa Concordia's bridge crew finally ordered an abandoned ship. Now also remember, it was right around the time that they finally ordered abandoned ship on board the Costa Concordia that they finally alerted the Coast Guard and other emergency personnel that the Costa Concordia was in trouble and needed assistance. I mean, honestly, I can't even believe it took them this long to at least alert the Coast Guard. You know, they even kept it quiet from them. They kept it quiet from the passengers and the Coast Guard, the two people you should keep informed as to what's going on on your ship. I mean, I can't even comprehend that. But because they waited this long to alert anyone, it would take the Coast Guard roughly another hour, hour and a half to actually arrive on scene to begin helping the passengers on board the Coast of Concordia. And another problem is because they waited so long to begin the evacuate and evacuation of this vessel, they missed their very narrow window of time for them to actually begin launching the Costa Concordia's lifeboats. This is just my carnival model, just pretend it's a Concordia. They missed their very narrow of time where they would actually be able to launch the Costa Concordia's lifeboats successfully while the ship was still resting on a more or less even keel. Because they waited so long, the Concordia was continuing to list more and more heavily to starboard. And this would in turn make it extremely difficult to launch some of the Costa Concordia's lifeboats. Eventually, it would make it impossible for them to launch the lifeboats from the ship. So they were really in a narrow race against the clock to try to get as many lifeboats off the Costa Concordia as possible before the listing of the ship proved to be so great that any more lifeboats launched from this vessel would be impossible. Now, I will say this for the crew on board the Costa Concordia. Once they actually ordered the evacuation and began mustering the passengers and began putting the lifeboats in the water, they were pretty efficient during this process. They did a pretty reasonable job at getting all the passengers organized and getting the lifeboats in the water in a quick and organized rate. However, the biggest issue they were facing at this point was the listing of the vessel due to the very late response of the ship's bridge crew in ordering the evacuation of the Concordia. Now, just to clarify one detail here, I do not blame all the members of the Costa Concordia's crew for everything that happened during the initial stages of the sinking. The only people I blame for that are the actual bridge crew on board the Costa Concordia for not sharing the information as to what's going on with the whole ship. What you have to remember is there's a large number of crew members on board the Costa Concordia who are just as much in the dark as to what's going on as the actual passengers and Coast Guard were. You know, they're waiting for instructions from the bridge crew as to what do we need to do. And once they were notified, a lot of these crew members were the ones who were actually handling putting the lifeboats in the water, getting the passengers organized, and handling the muster stations. And they did a pretty reasonably good job. And yeah, I think they should get praise for handling the evacuation as best they could, given the circumstances that they found themselves in. Now, as the sinking of the Costa Concordia was progressing, the island of Julio actually did send a number of rescue ships to the Concordia from the shoreline in order to help with the evacuation. And it's a good thing they did this too, because as the sinking of the ship was progressing, the list to starboard was now getting to the point where it was so severe that it would be next to impossible, if not completely impossible, to launch any lifeboats from the ship's port side anymore. 
So essentially what they had to do was all the lifeboats that they launched from the ship's starboard side, they essentially went to shore, dropped off the, the lifeboat's passengers, and then those lifeboats and other vessels went back to the coast of Concordia and picked up more passengers. However, even though this was partially effective, they did not have enough time to do this. The listing of the coast of Concordia was getting so severe that they actually had to abandon deck four and all the passengers had to retreat to the ports, uh, to the ship's port side and begin climbing on the ship's actual hull and sit on the side of the ship while they waited on the Coast Guard and other vessels to figure out a means to get them off of the vessel. Now, by the time the Coast of Concordia ended up rolling over and resting on its starboard side, there were still around 200 passengers on board the vessel, clinging to the vessel and resting on the ship's hull, waiting to be rescued. Now, that is horrible. By this point, there should have been no passengers on board the vessel at this point. However, one thing that I do need to say, by the time the order to evacuate the ship was given at 10.30 p.m., 10.35 p.m., right around there, the vessel completely rolled onto its starboard side in less than an hour. So that means in that short amount of time, they actually managed to get most of the 4,000 or so passengers on board the ship off the vessel. Honestly, given that short time frame of time that the crew who didn't know what was going on had to evacuate the passengers, I think they did a pretty good job. But still, there shouldn't have been any passengers left on the vessel. If the bridge crew would have given the order to evacuate as soon as they were suspicious that something was going on with the ship, they would have had more than enough time to get everybody off before the vessel got to this dangerous position and before the time that people would have been forced to climb through the ship's windows and decks and all that to wait on the ship's hull for rescue. Now, by the time the Coast Guard had arrived on scene, the crew that were still helping the passengers evacuate the coast of Concordia had actually set up these massive ladders on the ship's side that the people still on board the ship were using to climb down the ship's hull and get to the rescue boats waiting on the water. Now, as the Coast Guard was investigating, it soon became apparent that one key member of the Costa Concordia's crew, Captain Scatino, had actually already left the vessel in one of the ship's lifeboats and was resting comfortably on shore watching the rescue play out. And upon learning this, the Coast Guard contacted Captain Scatino, and you know what? I think I'm just going to play the audio from their conversation and let you guys form your own opinion on this situation. Senta, io sono De Falco da Livorno, parlo col comandante. Sì, buonasera, comandante Di Falco. Mi dica il suo nome, per favore. Sono il comandante Schettino, comandante. Schettino? Sì. Ascolti, Schettino. Ci sono persone intrappolate a bordo, adesso lei va con la sua scialuppa. Sotto la prua della nave, lato dritto, c'è una biscagina. Lei sale su quella biscagina e va a bordo della nave. Va a bordo della nave e mi viene a dire, mi riporta quante persone ci sono. Lei è chiaro? Io sto registrando questa comunicazione, comandante Schettino. Allora, ricordate, le dico una cosa. Parli a voce alta. Allora, la nave ha detto, io sono qua, di fronte... Comandante, parli a voce alta. In questo momento, la nave è inclinata. Ho capito. C'è gente, ascolti, c'è gente che sta scendendo dalla biscagina di prua. Lei quella biscagina la percorre in senso inverso, sale sulla nave e mi dice quante persone. E che cosa hanno a bordo? Chiaro? Mi dice se ci sono bambini, donne o persone bisognose di assistenza. E mi ne dice il numero di ciascuna di queste categorie. È chiaro? Guardi il schettino che lei si è salvato forse dal mare, ma io la porto veramente molto male, faccio passare in anima di guai. Vado a bordo, cazzo. Comandante, per cortesia. Che sta facendo, comandante? Sto qua per coordinare i soccorsi. Che sta coordinando lì? Vado a bordo, ti coordini i soccorsi da bordo. Lei si rifiuta? No, no, non mi sto rifiutando. Lei si sta rifiutando di andare a bordo, comandante? No, 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 e mi dica qual è il motivo per cui non ci va. Ci sto andando perché ci sta l'altra lancia che si è fermata. Lei vada a bordo, è un ordine. No, ma si rende conto che è buio e che qua non vediamo nulla. E che vuole tornare a casa, Schettino? È buio e vuole tornare a casa? Salga sulla prua della nave tramite la biscacina e mi dica ora... I, no joke, have no words for what I just watched. I cannot believe that the actual captain of the Costa Concordia abandoned his ship and was just sitting on the shoreline watching the rescue play out. And 
Just to clarify something a little bit here, this isn't just as simple as him hopping into a lifeboat and leaving. He actually took steps to try to prevent himself from being caught. He actually went back to his room after the order to evacuate was given, changed into a suit, then went and got into a lifeboat and left the vessel. And it turns out, I found this out too, at the time of the sinking, Captain Scatina was a married man and he was on board the vessel with his mistress. Yeah, wow, that shows a real good judge of character right there on you, man. Listen, that's that's pretty messed up. And then anyway, a little bit later, after the rescue was completed um, and the cleanup of the Costa Concordia wreck site was actually underway, Captain Scatino ended up going to trial for this, which he should. You know, a captain should be the last person off a vessel. You are the captain of the ship. It is your responsibility to make sure all the passengers and crew that are on that ship and under your watch get off the vessel before it sinks. Anyway, at the trial for this, he actually said, and I'm not making this up, he tripped and fell into a lifeboat. I, <laughs> I'm sorry, but it makes me mad just talking about it. And then he has the he, he has the guts to say to the Coast Guard that he's coordinating the rescue from the shoreline. Coordinate the rescue on your ship. You are the captain. It is your responsibility to all those people on board that vessel. You know Captain Smith on the Titanic? He didn't leave the ship until quite literally the final moments of the sinking. Captain Smith was last seen going into the water as the bridge of the Titanic right here was going under. He never got into a lifeboat. He never did anything. He was a captain on his vessel, and he did everything he could to ensure that as many people as possible got off the Titanic before it sank. Captain Scatino, you could learn a thing or two from Captain Smith. Now, by the next morning, after the evacuation had basically concluded, it had been discovered that around 32 people had died on board the Costa Concordia during the sinking. Now, with the vessel itself, the ship would, in fact, stop settling in the water because due to the fact that the vessel was sinking in such shallow water, the vessel would basically end up stabilizing and resting with basically half of the ship sticking up out of the water, and the vessel would be resting completely on its starboard side. So, after Captain Scatino was taken to trial for everything that happened during that night, he was convicted and sentenced to 16 years in prison which honestly, I think he should have gotten worse for that, given the whole circumstances of the tragedy. Believe it or not, Captain Scatino did try to appeal this. And once again, I can't make this up. Those 32 people that died in the sinking, he actually tried to say that that wasn't his fault because they didn't die when the ship hit the rock. They died because of the sinking. I'm not even gonna comment on that. I'm not even gonna, that doesn't even qualify for a comment. I can't even, I can't even comprehend that. So now, after he was dealt with, the only other issue was what to do about the wreck of the Costa Concordia. The people at the island of Julio did not want that massive vessel being stuck there forever. And there were environmental concerns as well because the vessel had, you know, fuel on board and a bunch of other stuff that they didn't want to contaminate the local waters if the ship was to break up. So then a massive effort was put into effect to try and actually salvage the vessel and actually refloat it and tow it away from the island of Julio to be taken to a scrapyard where the ship would in fact be broken up. The whole process to raise the Costa Concordia took a period of around two years. Essentially what they did first was build this custom crane system that could actually pull the vessel and allow it to sit upright in the water. And then once they did this, they connected a series of ballast tanks on the both sides of the vessel to allow them to partially refloat the ship so it could be towed to a port where the vessel could in fact be broken up. This whole process took a period of two years, and quite honestly, it is one of the most impressive salvage operations I have ever seen. But in the end, it was a complete success, and the Costa Concordia was successfully towed away from the island of Julio and broken up in a scrapyard. So yeah, now you guys know the story of the Costa Concordia. Now, if we take a look at this tragedy looking back on it from a retrospective, to be honest, I'm very surprised that only 32 people died when this vessel went down. You know, just given how short of a time frame they had from the moment that the order to evacuate was given and given how, miscommun how much miscommunication there was on the ship that night, to be honest, it's a miracle that only 32 people died. Now, don't take what I'm saying out of context here. It is a tragedy that those 32 people died. And honestly, they shouldn't have died at all. You know, the crew, if they would have handled the evacuation properly, 
it looks like they would have had more than enough time to get everybody off before the ship sank. But given how the entire disaster played out, to be honest, we are very lucky that this disaster was not a lot worse than what it actually was. Anyway, guys, that's it for this video. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it and found it interesting. And yeah, now you know the story of the Costa Concordia. All right, everybody. Well, hey, thank you all for being here. And be sure to like this video. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already. And yeah, you guys just keep doing what you do. You guys are awesome. If you have any video ideas or any suggestions for future videos, please leave it in the comments below. And hey, without any further ado, thank you all again. All right, everybody. Well, hey, you all stay safe out there, and I'll see you in the next one. Have a good night, everybody. Special thanks to my very first Captain Level Patreon supporter, John Shepard. Thank you so much for all the support, man.